Uh, my name's Thomas. I'll be teaching this class. Uh, something quick about me. I'm from Hong Kong. Uh, my doctor is from uh, locally. I went to uh, US several places. Uh, but to summarize, um, I guess this is to um, augment Irene's earlier comment. Uh, I have a doctoral degree. I have three masters from Australian, Singapore, US schools. I have uh, several uh, accounting destinations and all the finance related ones I have. It's my a uh, true professional, professional um, opinion that you don't really need this class. Provided you meet the following several criteria. First, you have no job. You have all the time to study. That's one. The second criteria is you have no family. So no boyfriend, no girlfriend, no spouses, no kids. Three, you have no hobby. Four, uh, for example, I come to you and say, I'm a good looking guy, I'm kind of funny, you took me to dinner and a movie. And then if you decide, I'd rather stay home and watch TV. If you meet all these criteria, you don't need the class. Because you can, you can study on your own and do fine. But otherwise, uh, if you have a job, if you have things you like to do, uh, time's limited. Uh, even if you don't sleep, it might be hard to read through all the material. So here, um, this is what, um, what we offer in terms of helping you pass the exam. Uh, we're not going to teach less than what's in the curriculum, but instead, uh, we're trying to have you learn the material more efficiently and effectively. Okay? So here, when you look at what's being taught, uh, if you look at the the formulas and things later on, um, it looks sort of rocket scientist-ish. But when you look at underlying content, uh, it's not really that difficult to understand. So in the class here, uh, we'll help you learn the material uh, through linking it to other things you know, either in CFA or from your job. Uh, so here, some background on the kayak, which Joanne had gone through. Uh, in terms of the focus, it's more AI focused than your CFA, which we focus on. There's also less intro material. So for CFA, you have a lot of CAPM, basic economics and things, which we don't have. We assume you already know, hopefully. Uh, for the exam, or for this part, which when I do my kayak, that's what I want to do. Um, someone will talk about this more later on but from people in the class. So I taught it last few years. Uh, some want to be in the business because they think it's exciting, which it is. Some I found uh, as unlikely source are people that deal with the managers. Many from the back office, many from compliance, many from risk management, because they want to know what they do uh, so that they can augment or complement what, what they are kind of counterparts are doing. So um, it does help career-wise uh, in terms of having the kayak. In terms of what I think it looked like, um, for level one, there's been some changes last several years, but for level one, uh, the basics uh, are pretty straightforward. You have, you're given qualitative description of the various AI types, uh, what the manager does, uh, what the risks are, but for level one, there's also a heavy part on the quantitative. These are not the super hard ones, but some go back to your basic stats, to your ratios and various things that are specific for AI. So for example, uh, you might not have special benchmarks for regular investment, but you would have for AI. Right? Because if you ask me to trade gold for you, you're not going to pay me or my fees based on a regular uh, uh, metal return. Right? You want to go as a benchmark to see how good I am. Right? So here, that's what a quant part focus on, is performance, also on compensation. For level two, it's more focused on the detailed topics, but as you answer, for example, the essay, uh, the underlying premises is you remember your level one. So uh, it's not you take level one and then you forget them all and then level two you would pass. 
Uh, for the essay, it's pretty um, interesting in that you do it on the, on the computer. So you'll be answering essay type questions. Uh, there'll be quantitative and calculation as well, but it'll be more focused. For level one, it's more quantitative in general uh, measurement. For level two, we're focusing on various three to four uh, uh, AI investment. So for example, there'll be uh, um, convertible bonds arbitrage calculations uh, using binomial tree, but of course a basic version. So we'll look at those later on. In terms of study time, we mentioned earlier, it depends on who you are. I guess your experience and your IQ and you know your what you do with your time. Right? So this fluctuates depends on on uh, your background. When you look at our book, you might wonder, the original book kayak is only this thick, ours is thicker. So why take a course that gives you more book to read than the original material, right? So here, as you go through, please compare. Uh, the, uh, the kayak book is very, very good. I mean, I have every copy of it. I have electronic copy on my mobile phone. But some, if I know the material, then it's very good reference. But if you're taking the exam, some are basics which they don't provide. They assume you know in the original text. So in our book, we give more details, like examples on calculations on what's being described in the actual text. So you can read the formula and then actually get to do practice questions on those in the exam than you would have done it already. And so it's more in that sense. For level two in particular, just now, Joanne mentioned the core and integrated topics. Those in that book, there are about 20 odd research papers, which people in the, uh, uh, in the education world does. So for those, when they do the research, I mean, they don't do it for kayak. So their goal is to find something in the finance world that people can use. So at the end of the paper, they would conclude by saying, I found this to be the case. But they don't really say, so how does it link to the kayak program and what kayak is teaching? So that is the link we provide of showing you the researcher found this and in, in the real world, that's what they found as well and link it to the program curriculum. Okay. Here we'll start on the demo lecture. Uh, there's more interesting things later on about job leads and other things. So make sure when we finish, I'll be the first one to jump in to get his business card for job leads. But here, we're not going to do very detailed ones for the demo. Uh, it'll be more in depth in the course. But as an overall approach of the question being asked, you'll see two different types. One, uh, this is more quantitative. Descriptive, I mean, depends on uh, a type of question. For quantitative, you have some more difficult, but mechanical calculations. So for example, in uh, level two, there'll be some private equity fees that they ask you to calculate. I mean, it's not difficult, uh, but it's just complex and you have to do the right order. Others are easier. As a matter of fact, you might think it's only you know, five words. How hard can it be? But these are more theoretical. So it might ask you uh, in an in indirect way, in a binomial tree, when you get there, what happens? What does, it, what does that number mean? And if another thing change, how would that change? Okay, so two uh, major way questions are being uh, um, asked. So this is uh, some example of the fees involved in private equity. Right? If you have your management fee. It's based on your committed. Right? If you're an investor uh, and I'm the the PE manager, uh, you committed, let's say, 10 million. Right? Your fee of, uh, uh, let's say, 2% is based on the committed. And then you, there's organization fees, which if you join me and, and commit to my fund, I'll charge you upfront for my legal and setup. Right? And then, let's say a year later, I found the first investment. And I charge transaction fees on the firm which is based on the total investment size, not your committed. Right? So it's a different base of calculation. Uh, and that is I charge to the firm, not you. 
Right? Eventually, you pay for it by a lowering cost of the investment. Right? So all these need to know who pays it, how does it offset, and monitoring fee as well. As I acquire this firm, next year I charge the firm a fee to monitor it on your behalf. And all those reduces the firm value. So at the end, when I sell, that will come off your profit, but you need to make sure you assign it somewhere else, some to the right place. Uh, and then performance fee on the net profit after you take off the leverage, with, which are the debt I, I use to buy the firm. So uh, it's not super difficult. If you work through several, you probably get most uh, 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 down pat. Other things they throw in there might be hurdle rates. Right? So here, um, you might not, I might promise you a 10% return, and you, you get that first before I get my carry interest. So that throws something into the, the picture of not a direct calculation. There might be clawbacks, which if I sell the last investment and I charge my fees uh, more than what I should, you can get some back. Right? So all those will muddle the calculations somewhat. But this is the mechanical, but seems to be more difficult ones. The other type are the easier version, but it's more theoretical. So you need to be very good with how the conceptually how the calculation work to be able to, be able to answer. So for example, uh, in level one, uh, they do the binomial tree introduction. So you will need to know the binomial tree, how to calculate. In level two, they use binomial tree instead of pricing option, which is the basic easier version, they do, they do it for convertible bonds. Because if you do options, let's say stock options, your tree is based on your stock, only one thing, right? For your convertible, your tree is based on two things, your debt and your, e and your, and your equity. So it f it's more fluctuations, more things to do. Uh, and then also we look at, in level two, how to use the same tree for your CDS calculation. So this is for your risk default adjustment uh, probability calculation. So all those will be in there. If you know the concept, it's, not, it's very easy to calculate. But if you don't, then you won't even know which number to start. Okay, so here, uh, that's what we'll do. Just as something, you know, a few minutes on a binomial tree. So this is the basic version in level one, where we do the options version only. So first is you figure out what the underlying asset is worth at expiry. And then you figure out what it's worth at that time for the option or derivative. And then you just present value it to today, right? So here for step one, let's say today you come to me and ask for my autograph. Actually, every day someone asks me to autograph for them to start with anyway. So today, you come to me after class and say, oh, Thomas, I like you so much. Please sign my shirt. <laughs> so I take this and I sign your shirt. You, you want to figure out, so how much is his autograph worth if I keep your shirt and don't wash it <laughs> and just put it in a, in, a, in a picture frame and put it at home? So here, the first step would be, I'm the underlying asset now. You want to figure out what I'm worth let's say five years down the road. So the step one is, what am I worth? Let's say if my value go up. Let's say I win two Nobel Prizes within the five years, or I'm one of those weird killers that, kill <laughs> that kill 10 people in the, in the city center. Either way, I get very famous, so I'm up there. Or I'm a nobody and I'm down here. So that's the first step. Second step here, let's not do this, would be, you check, if I'm very famous, what is my signature worth at that time, right? So you might check Michael Jackson's glove and see how, f how far price go up for that, for an estimation. And then the last step is just based on the earlier step, whatever my um, signature is worth at the end, which is the derivative, you just press and value back to today. So conceptually, conceptually it's very straightforward. Uh, calculation is a little bit difficult, but it's not super hard. Okay, so these are the things you'll be asked for both level one and two. Here's one example on a more, this is, uh, uh, I'll let you read two minutes first and then we'll go through. This is more of conceptually, do you know uh, some basic bond information?
Oh, sorry. What do you think? If you have children, or if you played this before when you were young, this is like musical chair, right? You have people standing around walking, and the music stop. Uh, everyone sits down, but eventually, effectively, everyone just moved over a little bit to wherever they are, but the same order. So this is now where I have this U curve hum shape, and that is how they price that, right? So next year, if you're the guy and you assume or expect the same yield for the time periods for the maturity. So a year later, the seven become a six maturity, right? So you just check what happens to the price to see, to decide whether you want a long or short that bond, right? So if I just take one or two of these, for the seven year, for example, right now it's 450, right? A year later, it'll be a six year. So the yield would be 375. So it's 450 now. The market's going to be 375 later. So the market rate had gone down. This bond will increase in price, right? So if I'm today, what I want to do for seven, I would buy it. I would long the seven. Next year, the price would go up. Right, and vice versa. So if I look at uh, bond five, I would want to long five as well because the yield will be lower when we become a four year next year. And the same for four and six. So for six, the yield is going up, so the price would come down. I would want a short six years. For the four year, it's hard to say because they don't give me a three year bond yield. So based on these three, I want to check whether I have you know the correct answer here. So here, I'm along the six. This one is already out. Long the six. This one is already out. So effectively, B is the only possible answer we have. Right? We're long the seven. So we buy it. The part, the price will go up next year. For the six, I would short it, where the price would come down next year. Yeah. So uh, if you know what's what it's asking, you can get to it pretty quickly. But it's not a uh, it's not a very quantitative version in this. Any question you want to ask before I pass it to our next presenter? Okay. 